Sally Ann was the youngest of four girls and was born in Carshalton, South London, in September 1987. She had her sights set on fame. She was a student at the Brit School, a performing arts school that helped Adele and Amy Winehouse develop their skills. She was also a part-time hairdresser. She was six feet tall, a model, and the face of Swatch, which attracted Pulse model management's attention and led them to sign her right away. On Saturday, September 24, 2005, Sally and her older sister were looking forward to a night out on the town after a busy week. The women made the choice to spend their evening at Lloyd's Bar on Croydon High Street rather than venture into London. The companions drank and enjoyed themselves, but at one in the morning Sally decided she had had enough and waited for a cab to take her to a friend's house. Sally and called her ex-boyfriend Lewis, who was in Kingston at the Works nightclub, as soon as she got there and requested him to pick her up and take her home. Around 2.20 a.m., he picked her up and started back to her house in his car. The two battled over their relationship ending on the drive, with each accusing the other of infidelity. Two hours passed during the dispute, and Lewis will never forget it. It was merely jealousy. I imagine she had been out with boys that night, and she had been out with girls. There may have been shouting, but it wasn't loud. No one would have heard it from outside the car. We hugged and kissed one other after making up. Sally Ann, though, objected and we got into a fight. Overall, it took from the time we came there for one and a half to two hours. Sally's home on Blenheim Crescent was close to where the 20-year-old plasterer had stopped the car, but Sally wasn't yet prepared to break her relationship with her ex. I leaned across her to open the passenger door. She and I got out of the passenger side. I went to get into the car again but she didn't want me to and she grabbed my t-shirt ripping my chain from my neck. After a couple of minutes, I got back into the car and locked the doors. Sally and picked up her handbag and I saw her walking away through the rear view mirror. The last thing I saw of Sally and was her entering her front garden. She was looking at me for the first couple of seconds as she started to walk towards the garden. Sally Ann's neighbors heard her screaming around for 20 in the morning, but no one went outside to investigate. Her attacker had already stabbed her several times outside of her house, but he kept attacking because no one had opened their door to investigate the source of the cries. As Sally Ann lay dying, he brutally raped her. One of the neighbors who heard Sally scream shortly after the incident discovered the 18-year-old nearby her home, covered in blood. I put on my dressing gown and slippers and went across the road. I walked round the left side of the skip. I just felt I knew what I would see. I knelt, just as a natural thing, and said, oh, poor darling. As people surrounded the quiet lane, the police were summoned, and the house was blocked off. Sally Ann's autopsy was completed fast, but the results weren't what the police had anticipated. They discovered bite marks on Sally's neck, chest, and cheek in addition to the knife wounds, some of which had gone all the way through her body. The neighborhood was stunned by the brutal attack. Despite the densely crowded location, there were no actual witnesses or security cameras. So the search for the teenager's killer started in earnest. Even though it wasn't going to be simple to locate him, they did have one piece of solid proof, the murderer's DNA. When phone records revealed that Lewis, Sally and boyfriend, had warned her about seeing other men, he was eventually arrested for her murder. Lewis had initially been designated as the case's primary suspect. He was freed four days later because his DNA didn't match the sample that had been discovered at the crime scene. DNA testing started happening all around Croydon about five months after Sally Ann's murder. Only 771 men out of the 340,000 residents in the area volunteered to give their samples. 
the investigation was becoming cold and the cops had no other information. By February, not much had changed in the course of the homicide investigation involving the 18-year-old. For more months would pass before Sally Ann's murderer came forward. Many people in the Croydon neighborhood had gone out that September Saturday. There were numerous places to socialize in the town, over 150 bars and pubs, to be exact. This evening, a different celebration was going on two miles away while Sally Ann was drinking in Lloyd's Bar on the High Street. That evening, Mark Dixie was honoring his 35th birthday. After arriving home from a camping trip earlier that day, the bar cook spent his evening drinking at the Windsor Castle pub with a few buddies. Dixie and his pals ultimately left the bar around 2.30 a.m. after engaging in heavy drinking and drug usage. They then went back to a home on Avondale Road, where he spent the rest of the evening alone on the sofa below. Mark Dixie was arrested on June 15, nine months later, following a brief altercation over the England vs Trinidad and Tobago football match he was watching in a pub in Crawley, West Sussex. No matter how trivial the crime was at this point, police were allowed to take DNA from everyone who was arrested. Dixie cried that day while being interrogated and swabbed, making the detention officers laugh. Later, the cause of his emotional outburst would become clear. The method takes two weeks to process Mark Dix's DNA and return a match to the sample taken from Sally and Bowman. While taking a smoke break at work, Dixie was detained. Police discovered pictures of Sally Ann and video of him over them while searching his property. The tavern cook was put on trial at the Old Bailey in February 2008, after entering a not guilty plea to the 18-year-old's murder. He was portrayed as a freeloader who took advantage of others during the trial, and many of his friends and acquaintances came forward to share their personal accounts of the evil not mad, man. The jury was informed that Dixie had his buddies trapped in their bedroom so they wouldn't notice his departure. Additionally, it was discovered that he had attempted to clean up the bite marks and pour cement dust down Sally Ann's throat in order to eliminate his DNA from her body. Additionally, the court was informed that Dixie once resided only a few doors away from Sally Ann. Later, he admitted to Sally Ann as she lay lifeless or near death, but he steadfastly denied killing the adolescent, saying he had discovered her unconscious and taken advantage of the circumstance. He claimed that after biting her cheek, he realized she was dead. After three hours of discussion, the jury unanimously found him guilty of murder on February 22. He was transported to HMP Franklin in County Durham after receiving a sentence of at least 34 years in jail. One of the longest minimum sentences ever imposed in the UK was imposed during the sentencing. Detective Superintendent Cundy addressed the media following the judgment. Mark Dixie will likely spend the rest of his life in prison, which will safeguard the public from a seriously dangerous sexual killer. A young woman with her entire life ahead of her, Sally Ann. The most heinous means possible was used by Mark Dixie to end her life. As the trial progressed and more information became available, the court learned that Dixie had lived in Australia from 1993 to 1999. He had followed Sandra, a girlfriend with whom he eventually had two sons. Perth was being stalked at the same time by the Claremont serial killer, and for a while it was believed that Dixie and the killer were one and the same. Dixie continued to harm others even though his DNA showed he wasn't the ideal man for the job. In addition to robbery, burglary, indecent assault, exposure, and assaulting a police officer, the chef had a lengthy criminal history. He had used identities like Mark Down, Stephen McDonald, and Shane Turner, and after committing a sexual offence, he had been expelled from Australia. Dixie ultimately acknowledged killing Sally and Bowman in 2015. 
He also admitted to having sexually assaulted two more women. He attacked a woman in 1987, when Dixie was only 16 years old, pushed her into her own automobile, and sexually assaulted her. The woman managed to escape after being chained to the door and burned with the car. A Thai student in Australia in 1998 was stabbed and left for dead after being threatened with a knife to take off her clothing. Despite the attack, the victim lived. Mark Dix's DNA was identified at the scene. He then admitted to committing a vicious rape in 2002. On a flight of steps, he sexually abused the woman and beat her with a knife sharpener. She supposedly made it through the assault. While residing in Spain with his girlfriend, Dixie is also accused of robbing, assaulting, and sexually assaulting three women. He had had 17 other criminal convictions in all, and in 2017, Dixie received two additional life terms for the sexual assaults that occurred in 1987 and 2002. At the time, it was questioned why Australian authorities did not imprison Mark Dixie, or at the very least list him on a sex offender registry for his actions. Dixie had been sentenced to pay a fine and was being deported at the time. Linda, Sally Ann's mother, stated in the mirror, we now know he was detained at least three times in Australia but he was deported without any warnings from the authorities. They didn't do their job properly, and that's why my daughter died, the speaker said. Levi Belfield, Ian Huntley, and the late Peter Sutcliffe are said to be pals with Mark Dixie, who is still incarcerated at HMP Franklin. Dixie has been connected to a number of unsolved crimes over the years, including the assault on a lady just hours before Sally and in the same area, and the 2005 homicide of homeless woman Jennifer Keeley. Even yet, it appears that there isn't any recent news. If the breakthrough was over a year ago I'm wondering why they haven't tried to find a link to Dixie. Jennifer's mother deserves answers, Sally Ann's mother Linda told in 2018. Stuart Cundy, the detective superintendent, criticized how quickly Mark Dixie was found. In my opinion, a national DNA register might have identified Sally Ann's murderer in less than 24 hours provided it had all the necessary protections. In contrast, it took almost nine months before Mark Dixie was found, and almost 2.5 years before justice was served. The National DNA Registry Bill was rejected by the government on the grounds that it would be impractical to protect a database of 60 million individuals at the time, let alone the moral objections to including every UK resident in a database for the purpose of making it easier to apprehend criminals. Mark Dixie is currently 50 years old and has a release date of possibly 2040, making it improbable that he would ever venture outside again. His motivations have come under scrutiny over time. He was a tall, attractive man with plenty of female fans. It has been suggested that his upbringing is what led to his behavior. Dix's father abandoned the family when he was 18 months old and never came back. In his place, Ronald McDonald, a new stepfather, entered the house and began brutally torturing and beating the boy. When Dixie was 12 years old, his mother in Streatham abandoned him on the stairs of a children's home. At the age of just 14, he was brought into care and started robbing others. He was 15 when he assaulted a teacher in the face, was expelled, and was sentenced to six weeks in a young offender's facility. Even as adults, there was still violence. Dixie was kicked out of the house he lived with his girlfriend and small son three weeks prior to Sally Ann's murder. But instead of hanging around, he got on a coach and travelled to Amsterdam where he drank and used drugs until his money was gone. Dixie had tried to talk his girlfriend into taking him back the night Sally was killed, but she refused. The chef may have lost it that night due to a string of circumstances that built up over time, but it does not excuse his horrible actions. 
Sally Ann's body was removed from her burial in 2013 because the location had grown to be a haven for antisocial behavior, and her gravestone had been vandalized four times in a period of six months. Sally Ann's memory has been damaged by individuals who have little regard for the dead, despite the fact that her family has some closure now that Mark Dixie has admitted to killing their girl. Thank you.